Hey. hey. How are you? Good. I had no idea how to do this, by the way. I've been asking Janet, what do I do? And uh, I, hope, I hope it's working right. Is it? It is. Super okay, simple, good. right? Just accept? It's a little bit complicated, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for coming on our live. Thanks, thanks for having me. So a little background on Rika. She's eight and a half months now. We got her in April during COVID lo lockdown. So Dave mm -hmm. and I have been in the house all day, every day. And we're dealing with some separation anxiety. Mm -hmm. And Rika, in the beginning with crate training, she was calm and she would go into the, well, after the puppy crying and all that, she mm -hmm. would go into the crate, it was fine. Now cut to at eight months, she is very, very, I'm gonna call it bratty. She's right. crying and wants to be let out. With the crying, uh, Dave is on conference calls all day long, so can't have that puppy crying. Right. And what do we do? <laughs> well, you know, I mean, part of the crate issue is going to be easier to solve if the dog sees it's a positive thing, right? So, I mean, you know, people say it's a denning thing. It's, it's, it's nothing to do with that. It has to do with just a safe space. This is a space I like to be in. This is a space where great things happen. Um, the most successful people with crate chaining are going to be people who make the crate um, kind of an event and they make being out of the crate a non-event. So for example, um, I go in my crate, I get fed. I go in my crate, I get toys. I go in my crate, I get attention. I come out of the crate, nothing happens, right? That's kind of the mindset for the dog. I mean, solving problems is always very um, easy for me to say, I would do this and it would work because it worked with this dog, this dog, and this dog, but it didn't work with every dog, mm -hmm. right? There's, there's no one stop shop for, for dog training. It's mm -hmm. kind of just out thinking the dog. Mm -hmm. And and that's kind of what you're facing with with your dog is what why is she barking when she's in the crate right is that where she's barking the most is she barking when she's when she's outside where are the issues so it's it's inside when I am let's say doing a live like this I mean mm. the the crate is in front of me she's seen me right talking she wants to be a part of it and it yeah. happens too when we're filming with other people I've been filming with some trainers and she just cries and cries and nothing else matters. She's just- Right, because it's exciting to her, right? So that she's getting, anytime a dog, especially a dog like a Malinois with prey drive has a level of excitement, they wanna be a part of it. And part of training that dog, whether you're doing protection work, obedience work, or just basic socialization work, the dog has to know there's a time for you to do something and there's a time for you not to do something. And the not doing something is an event, just like doing something, right? So the dog whines, right? And then you're going to say, hey, 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 stop it. And even just like an acknowledgement or body language towards the dog is then something that if the dog understands it, great, then the dog is going to go, oh, I got to do something. But if the dog doesn't understand it or it's not meaningful to the dog, then the dog just kind of is trying to figure it out. So the dog will continue to whine or escalate it up or try to take on a behavior to try to figure that out. So if the communication isn't clear with a dog, whether it's aggression, fear, anything, or, or a behavior, an obedience behavior, then the dog has to figure it out. That's how they've survived you know, thousands of years because they, they, see, they see a problem, they're problem solvers, and they're gonna to try to figure it out. So the best thing to do is to teach the dog what you want the dog to know, reinforce it, introduce distractions, and then it's proofed. Mm -hmm. But until then, it's a complete guessing game, right? So you're literally just saying, oh, well, let me try this. Let me mm -hmm. try that. And the more we try one thing, and then what we tend to do as humans, we go to extremes. So I'm going to look at you and tell you to be quiet. Okay, mm -hmm. fine. I'm going to just ignore you. I'm not going to do anything. So now the dog is at two ends of the spectrum, right? And now they're really trying to ping pong into the solution. Mm -hmm. But you can't train a dog in an environment that is, is too stressful, mm -hmm. right? And that's what we tend to do with dogs. We tend to only try to solve the problem when the problem is at its, at its pinnacle. Mm -hmm. Okay, the dog is fine with other dogs, but now the dog is in front of another dog, the dog's aggressive, now I'm gonna tell him to stop it, I'm gonna yank on his leash, I'm gonna, I'm gonna yell at him, I'm gonna get in front of him, I'm gonna do all these things. That's not the right time to solve the problem, right? The right time to solve a problem is to see that there's a problem, remove the dog from the situation, and then figure out how to replicate the situation and turn it into a training event. Mm -hmm. It's like, if you can't swim and you fall off the boat, I'm not gonna say, just do this, just do this, right? Mm -hmm. I'm gonna get you out of the water and I'm gonna bring you to a pool and say, we better learn how to swim.
-hmm. And it's the same with dog training. And that's the mistake people make in dog training, right? Dog training is so simple. I have no idea why any dog trainer in the world has a job, including myself. But when you think of how people try to solve problems, and I always go back to when I taught martial arts, when I taught kids martial arts, you have to kind of spell it out. You have to give them a, 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 um, a program to follow, but then you, hey, Jimmy, Jimmy, Jimmy. But then you have to, um, you know, you have to, you have to introduce a distraction that's going to make it a little bit rough, right? In other words, um, it, it, I always explain it. Like if I tell you a hundred times how to block a punch and block a punch, and then I never punch you in the face, you're never going to really know that you should be blocking it. And I'm not equating one with the other, but, um, but in a learning Quiet. situation, the dog needs to know that there is a repercussion, right? Like Jimmy knows, Jimmy's digging on the couch. I say, hey, stop it. He goes, okay, I got it. I'm not allowed to do that. Because he knows he's going to get corrected. Goofy's going to get corrected. You know, Dwayne's going to get corrected. And it's a really important piece for people to understand that that makes a lot of sense to the dog. Mm -hmm. So what I have been doing I, I gave her a Kong with peanut butter. She was fine for, let's say, 15 minutes. Now she's mm -hmm. done with it. And right. now she's crying now. I have been con conditioning the quiet and yeah. training it. Yeah. Um, it works sometimes. Again, right. now I'm doing the, this live. Right. Um, and I mean, at this point, what would you recommend doing? Well, so, so the clicker isn't going to work. The clicker is for marking a behavior in time, a moment in time, right? It's, it's, it's an overused tool because it's become very gimmicky. So in other words, you can use it. Like you'll see Janet uses her, her clicker to do the dog gets into position, boom, click, boom, reward, right? But if you're asking a dog for a lengthy duration of, of, of behavior, for example, to be quiet, the best thing to do, the way I would do it with your dog is, and it's not going to happen today, obviously, but is I would put the dog in the crate. When the dog is quiet, I would remove the dog from the crate. That's when you re release, right? But it's not a clicker type um, training. It's, it's not going to work through a clicker because what are you marking? Click, okay, you're quiet. Click, okay, you're quiet. There has to be an end to it. So if, in other words, if you, the dog is quiet, good, quiet, come on out or click, and then the dog comes out. And then the dog gets to do something fun and you build into the duration. Okay. That's the main thing. You're just, you're just dealing with a dog who's frustrated, who's a pup, who's eight months old, who's, you know, wants to do something. It's a Malinois. I mean, that's, you know, I always tell people, you got the dog you got. Yeah. You know, if you decide to get a dog like a Malinois, then you're going to have to deal with those kind of things. The number one thing people always complain about is my dog bites. Well, you got a Malinois. That's what they're bred to do. Right. Right. So you've got a high drive dog. That's just, she wants to go do something. And sometimes the more they can see you, the more they know that, well, every time I see you, we get to do something. But now suddenly you're standing there ignoring me. So I must be doing something wrong. So mm -hmm. I'm going to try to do something right. And that is going to be through whining. And, and remember, whining isn't always Wait, a sad time thing. Out. Wait, yeah. time out. Dave, don't let her out right now. She actually just quieted down. She just quieted down. Yeah, give her, give her a minute of being quiet and then let her out, right? You want to release oh. her. Okay. Okay. Can I can let her out, right? <laughs> you, want, you have to mark the behavior you want and not punish a behavior you don't want. And that's the number one mistake people make, right? I've got no problem with corrections. In fact, I love correcting dogs. But if they're doing something right, you're going to teach them through negative and positive. You're going to teach them through rewarding the good behaviors and, and correcting the bad behaviors. That's the difference. I always fight this with trainers, the difference between punishment and corrections. Punishments are punitive. Punishment, the dog is in there whining. Uh, you take the dog out, you slap him up, you yank him around, you, you know, do whatever, and you throw him back in there. That's punishment. It's punitive. It's, it's nonsense. Mm -hmm. Correction is, you know, to, a, 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 an e collar for a barking, which I mean, I'm not recommending for your puppy, but you know, for a bark collar for a dog who's in the car acting nutty, a, um, a pop on the leash for lunging at another dog, any of those things. Those are corrections. Corrections correct a bad behavior. If you knew there was something you could do to stop that behavior, for example, let's say, I'm not saying this one either, but a shake can would work, right? So she's whining, 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 you shake can, hey, quiet. And the dog's quiet. And you say, oh, good, quiet. Good. And, right, yeah. And you mark it. But the problem with quiet training is you end up 
ping-ponging the dog, right? So you say, good, quiet, and she's whining, oh, bad, quiet, right? Oh, good, quiet, and you end up becoming like, a, you know, a bipolar, you know, dog trainer where you're just bouncing off the walls trying to figure out the solution. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't work as well. Okay. Oh, that was helpful. So basically just when she's quiet, then let her out. Yeah, you're going to just have to get her used to excitement. Malinois are notoriously really have a bad time with it. Any high drive dog, because they're seeing it something and they need to be a part of it. You know, I would, I would feel sl uh, slower durations. Slow durations? Yeah, slower durations. If she's in there for five, ten minutes, take her out. Good girl, you know. But when she comes out, nothing happens, right? It's not like she comes out and she gets to play tug or she gets to do something. She mm -hmm. comes out, okay, good. And then she's out, nothing. She goes in, good girl. Something good happens in there. Okay. Eventually, she'll just learn to settle mm -hmm. in her place. Okay. Thank you. That was very, yes. very helpful. Okay. So we, have a, we had a ton of questions for you. One question from Zay the Mal was, how do you transition your dog off of the prong collar? Well, you know, the, the important part with prong collar, or any corrective collar, whether it's e-collar, prong collar, choke collar, anything, is to, is to use it as a teaching tool. So you want to start to associate behaviors with the correction that the implement is going to use. For example, you have um, a prong collar and the, the dog is like lunging forward. I always put a verbal, like, hey, no, and then I pause and I pop on the prong collar. So what happens then is the dog associates, he says no, and then something negative comes. There's a, there's a physical repercussion to my verbal cue. So the dog learns. Every time he says that, this happens negatively. So what the dog is going to try to do is to outthink that, because dogs are obviously problem solvers. They'll learn that, okay, if he says no, and I stop before the, before the prong, which is why I put the pause in, gives the dog a chance to stop, then the dog learns that behavior. Right? Okay. Same thing with a rattlesnake, any, any negative, that you, we always have to give the dog a chance. The mistake people make is they put the correction, verbal correction onto the physical correction. And when they're tied too closely together, the dog sees it as a, as, as a, uh, as a punishment and just doesn't really want to avoid it or just becomes really you know, downtrodden with it. Mm -hmm. Well, you got a melon one. Yeah. <laughs> and... <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Now I have a yeah. better approach to this go. issue. Thank you. Yeah, just, just be patient. It's a puppy. I mean, the biggest, biggest problem everybody always says is, my dog's four weeks old, and I, you know, she'll hold like a, third, a, a 60 second stay. And I think, well, that's fantastic. That's like miraculous, right? Mm -hmm. that's, it's not something we want to think about. So, you know, I got mine going. Um, it's, it's not a big deal. I mean, you have a dog, right? Mm -hmm. People who are so micromanaged on the dogs shouldn't own dogs, right? They're going to do stuff. They're going to bark. They're going to pee in the house. They're going to do this. They're going to do that. And you have to understand that and accept it. That's just what it is. Okay. All right. Um, okay. I mean, this is kind of similar to the crate issue. Um, mm -hmm. Anna is not real. She has a Malinois in Manhattan. She lives in an apartment, and the dog is barking every time the ele elevator ding goes off. Yeah. Well, th that's a bad decision, right? I mean, it's it's not a great decision to get a dog like a Malinois if you live in an apartment in Manhattan. It's just it's just not. It's you know, it's kind of like I got a Ferrari and it stalls when I'm driving through the traffic in Manhattan. It was a bad decision. But since she got it, she's gonna to have to condition the dog to it. I mean, one thing, if it's an older dog, you can put a, I mean, bark collars are amazing tools. Maya cannot be in a car without a bark collar on. And if I do, I'm actually torturing her because she just goes nuts. She hears people near the car, she goes nuts and she works herself up. I put a bark collar on her and she's just happy. She just lays in the, in the car, and go, in the crate and goes to sleep. That might be a solution. It's a humane solution. But, you know, getting the dog not to do it, maybe over time the dog becomes so used to the bell that it kind of becomes really, you know, benign to the dog. But mm -hmm. for the most part, you got to solve the problem because it's not going to get evicted out of your apartment in Manhattan. Right. Um, another question from actually a lot of people was how to socialize your puppy. Well, you know, socialization, the mistake people make with socialization, and you see this a lot, um, you know, when you see dogs in the shelter, they, 
always, always, always make the mistake of thinking socializing means take the dog to a dog park, let the dog meet other dogs, let the dog uh, be very dog friendly and all that. I wrote an article a long time ago called The Danger of Dog Friendly Dogs. And the danger of dog friendly dogs is they think all dogs are friendly. And eventually they meet a dog who's not friendly and they get killed, right? So to be social means to, you know, it doesn't mean you have to run up and hug and kiss everybody and shake everybody's hand and talk to everybody. It just means you have to be cordial. So socialization, socializing a dog means exposing them to things that could be triggers. Cars, bicycles, other dogs, people, children, people of color, um, people of different sizes, people in uniform, and all these different things. They, the dog is your dog. It belongs to you and your pack or whatever you want to call that. The dog must be friendly and accepting of everything in my home and everything I tell them to be accepting of. He doesn't have to love other dogs. Dwayne is the most dog-friendly dog on the planet, right? Janet's done an amazing job just socializing him, and she takes him to agility and obedience trials and all this stuff. So he's got that skill. There's still every once in a while a dog that he just doesn't like that he'll bark at, and that's cool. Like people don't need to tell me my dog needs to be more friendly. It doesn't it's not it's an, it's nonsense. The dog's not going to bite anybody, and you know nobody should have their dog off leash. And if he, the dog was off leash, I can control my dog. And a dog like Dwayne or Jimmy or Goofy, they're not going to bite anybody anyway. Socialization means exposure in a safe environment with positive experience. The only way you can control a positive experience is by not letting them have a bad experience, like meeting a dog nose to nose and it blowing up in your face. Mm -hmm. yeah. So Jess Gray is live right now. How do you get a dog to stop wanting to chase bike joggers, bikers? Um, well, the thing with that is it's, it's, this deals with a component of the dog's prey drive, the dog's excitability, the dog's desire to chase, um, bite, kill, and eat whatever it's, it's, it's in front of it. That is a natural component of dogs. Mo unless you have like some crazy little toy dog that doesn't have that prey drive, all dogs were pred bred to be predators. That's how they eat. So it's a hardwired DNA. The way to do it is to focus on solid obedience in the absence of the distraction. When the, when the distraction is not there, then bringing the dog into the distraction and focusing on what you want the dog to do. People spend a lifetime telling the dog what not to do. Don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that. It's much easier if I tell my dog to do something and correct them for not doing that than to spend an immense amount of time to, okay, don't, don't chase them, don't lunge at them, don't bark at them, don't look at them, don't whine at them. Well, just tell them what you want them to do, right? Sit, look at me, heal. Those are jobs that I want the dog to do. And when the dog does it, I can say, good, very good, and move the dog away. Getting a dog to pay attention to you, to focus on you, a basic look command, which I talk about all the time, is one of the number one ways that to, to solve that prey drive issue. Because look at me, you can't lunge at the person on the bicycle if you're looking at me, mm -hmm. right? Okay, this is a question from Good Boy Dog Training. How, oh, what are your thoughts on a bite sleeve with your own dog? Well, you know, you can do it and you can condition it. It's not the best idea because for a dog to do protection, and I know you had Oscar Mora on, who's probably one of the best trainers and decoys around. I mean, I love Oscar. Um, he, that would be a great question for him. I can tell it to you from a behavioral standpoint. And the idea is that the dog, you want to condition a dog to the job that you want them to do, right? And the job you want that dog to do in the sport or in protection, whatever it is, is to move away from you and bite something in front of you. The dog will never, ever, ever be biting you in a competition or in reality and protecting you. So teaching the dog that behavior is counterintuitive to the dog, right? You're kind of hardwiring a behavior for the dog later on that you, you never want. You want the dog, you, you can do little rag work with the dog. You can do a little basic tug work with the dog to teach the dog good holds and stuff like that. But Protection work is one of, the, one of the only things you really do need, and you need a really good decoy, right? You need a really good helper to do this with you. You can't just let this, um, I've had bad people work my dog, right? It, it's a joy when you see somebody like Oscar working a dog because he's like impeccable at it. Like, I, I don't think I've seen somebody as good as him where they just get it. They know how to work the dog. They're, they're precise. They, they can move. He's young. He's agile. 
um, it's worth its weight in gold. I would definitely encourage somebody, if you're going to get into protection dog sports, not only to find a club, but find a good club and a good helper to work with. Okay. Um, my pity feral hound can't handle tug yet. What are some games we can play? I was hoping to teach drop. Well, so... Yeah, I mean, tug and drop. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I don't know the correlation between those two. Um, one thing you want to think about is is the breed of dog, right? So a lot of times, terriers are not notoriously great dogs for um, tugging and stuff like that because they tend to thrash. If you look at a dog like a Labrador, Labradors have soft mouths. Teaching them to tug is a little more complicated, but they have a really solid idea to bite and hold something. Shepherd, same thing, taught to bite and hold. Rottweilers, bite and hold. Um, dogs that are more thrashers, which would probably fall into the terrier category. And I'm, I'm really uh, spitballing this because I'm talking about a specific behavior in a breed. And really, we have to think about people say, well, you're generalizing in a breed. But that's why we have breeds, right? It's only really stupid people who say, well, you can't generalize like that. Well, you actually can, because mm -hmm. <clears throat> for generation of generation of generation, you bred a dog for a certain behavior. So you got to respect the dog you got, right? You're mm -hmm. not going to get prey drive out of a dog and you're not going to put, you know, I'm not going to get a lab to do really good protection work. It's just not going to happen. I mean, because they have a different bite. It's, it's a different thing. So, you know, teaching a dog to drop something is, is not hard to do. It's something that, you know, I do it through disabling the object or disabling the dog. Put the dog on a harness, lift the dog off of whatever it is, if the dog drops it, good. The dog gets a reward or gets to rebite. It's the way I taught you know, my shepherds to bite. It's the way I taught um, Dwayne to out and stuff. I meant uh, teach him to drop or an out. Um, it has to be fair, right? Mm -hmm. It has to be fair. I'm the dog's number one advocate in this lifetime. Everything I do has to be to the dog's benefit. And that includes corrections. If the dog doesn't drop, I mean, I'm going to correct the dog. I'm going to disable the dog by lifting the dog on a harness. I'm talking about a harness so that the dog is just kind of helpless, front paws in the air. When the dog drops it, yeah, good boy. Or, you know, with puppies, I just pick them up. I've got a video on my site where I showed that with Dwayne, where I would just pick him up when he dropped it. Yeah, go get it. And then I'll pick up, drop. Yeah, go get it. And it's very, very fair to the dog. Mm -hmm. So this brings us into the next few questions. Mm -hmm. um, what is the most effective way to correct a male puppy and a duchy, 10 week old? Well, the thing you want to be careful with dogs, you know, Malinois, Dutchies, German, working line, German Shepherds, Rottweilers, Dobermans, any of these working type dogs, the number one thing people correct them for is exactly what they got them for, which is biting, uh, you know, it being very assertive, being very dominant. And you run the risk of one or two things. One, you're going to either get the dog to become fearful of the idea of biting, or you're going to make them more aggressive, right? So... I would say one in correcting them is be fair, have a, a reward for the accomplishment of the goal that I'm trying to get the dog to do, whether it's out or, you know, or sit or whatever. I don't, you know, every correction I do for a dog meets that dog's temperament. And that's critical. And I mean, I can tell you, I've worked with more dogs than most people, be, mainly because of my work at the shelters, not because of my work in, in the private sector, but when you get there, you have to be able to read a dog. You have to know your dog. And people always say, well, how would I correct my dog? I don't know. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, it's like, you know, it's like, how do you correct your husband? You know, I don't know. You're married mm -hmm. to him. You know, I mean, I know my relationships with my friends, my fiance, my dogs, my family, and I know how to interact with them based on observation. You must be intuitive. Like your children, you might have two children. One might be very soft, one might be very hard. One, you might say, don't do that again. I didn't like it. And the kid's like, oh, I'm not going to do it again. And the other one, you got to kind of, you know, rough them up a little bit. Mm -hmm. I'm going to catch a lot of crap for that. Every time I say something like that, people go, oh, he's, he's abusive. It's, you, you need to understand the levels with people and with dogs to be very fair because all of our corrections, if we understand we're advocates for our dogs or advocates for our children, what we're trying to teach them really is life skills and life skills keep us alive. And if we want to get rid of that, if we want to kind of, you know, couch out down to this feel good, everybody gets a trophy thing. You know, we're heading in a dangerous path, especially with dogs. And a lot of people are getting malinois and rescuing pit bulls from the shelters and they refuse They baby it. They put the shirt in like a pink tutu and think it's funny. 
but it's not. The dog has a natural ingrained drive that must be understood and it must be met. Otherwise, you just, you know, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. um, okay, Shepherd's Daily Lives. How long is an appropriate amount of time for a Dutch in a crate versus buying an outdoor kennel? Being gone. Being gone for five to six hours a day, is it okay to crate a dog for that time frame or should I buy an outdoor kennel? Well, it's two different things. I mean, an outdoor kennel we use to just get the dog to kind of be in. Crates we really want to use for, to confine the dog so that we can one potty. And then an outdoor kennel, the dog's going to potty in the outdoor kennel. The dog's going to run around. The dog's going to live in the outdoor kennel. If you're going to be gone for a long period of time, that is a good idea because it gives it affords the dog more freedom. You don't want the dog just cooped up for six, seven hours. It's not fair to the dog. But crate training is something that we use because it teaches the dog a place command. It teaches the dog to be calm. It teaches the dog that there is a, um, a, a, a reward for being in there when they come out. It's two very, very different things. People think they're the same thing. Like people say, oh, I use an X-Pen for my dog and he's peeing in the house. Well, yeah, because he's sleeping over here and he's peeing over there. Yeah. Very, very different. So yeah, crate training and, and putting the dog in a pen are very, very different things for the dog. Mm -hmm. Okay, Raymond says on, I'm having a vacation for two months. Is it okay to leave my dogs to a professional pet boarding or have my relatives take care of them? Well, I would get a reference. I mean, if relatives are normally the kiss of death, right? Like they always do something to screw up the dogs. So unless you have somebody you really, really know, I would find somebody who does this professionally because your family is going to watch it and go, oh, you know, I got a chance to go on a vacation too. I'm, I'm, what do I do with your dog? Uh, it's a disaster, right? If you get references, you know it's a good pet sitter. There's nothing better than that. You, you can't just rely on your family to do it. I, I wouldn't. Mm -hmm. um, Robert, what are your thoughts on... Um, having two handlers. Both Dave and I love training Rika. I definitely, mm -hmm. per COVID, per my personal situation, I have, I definitely have more time with Rika. Mm -hmm. And I, um, I do the majority of the training. Mm -hmm. Do you think that, I mean, what are your thoughts on the dual handler? Does it work? Does I, you it know, matter? Well, I mean, if you have a child, they, they have two parents, right? So it, 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 it obviously works. Mm -hmm. I mean, like when, when we got Dwayne, um, the, the other dogs, you know, were, were kind of trained already. But we, when we got Dwayne, we made a very strong decision. Like we would um, be on the same page, you know. Now, Janet is more, is great with rewards and positivity. I'm a little bit more on the structure. And it actually has helped Dwayne really grow into a really amazing dog. But the biggest thing is that you and your partner be on the same page. Like these are the words we're going to use. These are what, this is what we're going to tolerate. This is what I'm seeing. This isn't right. I don't agree with this. I don't want that behavior. But yeah, if you're on the same page, I mean, you know, kids have two parents, you know, you just, you have to be consistent. The biggest problem is if you let them get away with something and then your husband doesn't, then you're, you're just doing the, the dog will just figure it out. Like, Oh, well, great. I can do it with you. And that's it. They're, they're pretty smart creatures, right? We don't give them that credit. They're simple. They're black and white, but they're, they're pretty smart. They've survived a long time. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Okay. Mike Karaki resource guarding tips. Well, you know, resource guarding, again, we're getting into a, a situation that we want to prevent before preferably before we want to fix it. Right? Mm -hmm. So when a dog is already at a resource guarding issue and resources can be either a person, a place or a thing. So um, it depends what the dog is guarding. The first thing, usually if it's a resource guarding, like a food aggression issue, I always hand feed the dogs. Everything comes through a work you do something and you get something. Dogs that understand that have a very easy time in never becoming resource guarders. Like I can walk up to any one of my dogs, doesn't matter what they have, and I can take it. Just in front of me, just walk up and take it. Now, the one that was interesting was Boz, our 18-year-old dachshund. When I first um, came, Jan and I first got back together, he was, I gave him a bone, and Jan said, oh, you're gonna, he's going to rip your face off when you go to get it away from him. And he was like, he's really a powerful dog. He, you know, I put my hand in there, and he was growling and this and that. And I just didn't back off. I, did, I didn't get aggressive with him, but I just showed him like, mm, that's not going to happen, right? Mm -hmm. And I just took it. So resource guarding is something you want to you want to prove before you have to solve it. So teach the dog. I, I give you a ball. You give it back. You get another ball. You 
you have a treat, I give you another treat, I get that treat. You, you do the mm -hmm. trading thing first. That must be understood with the dog so that later when you put a correction on it, if you must put a correction on it, then that's there because the dog didn't pay attention and didn't follow through mm -hmm. on the kind offer, right? We don't want to come in like, like a Navy SEAL and just bust in and, 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 and take the whole place down. We want to send in a piece on you know, an olive branch first. Like, hey, this is really what we want to do. Mm -hmm. And make that more beneficial for the dog. Then you can obviously, you know, correct the dog later. Mm -hmm. Okay, Robert, I just want to mark the time. We're mm -hmm. half hour in. Are you good? You... Sure. Are there more sure, questions? A little bit more. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Uh, okay, do you see this one question on the screen? Do you want to answer work it? Food? Is it no. the one that says make them work the for food? The one from Harshad. Hang on. Do you want to answer that? I don't, how do I? Oh, hang on. Um, That's up to you. I don't. Hang on. From from Harshield. Harshid seven seven seven. Oh yeah. Okay. I see it. Um. Oh yeah. I mean, I'm happy to answer. What's my opinion okay. on ear cropping and tail docking? Um. You know, it's a decision people make on their own. It's. I mean, I don't like it. Right. I think it's it's stupid. That's just a personal thing. You know, it's, it's something that I'm not for, but it's like a tattoo. If you like tattoos, then, then get a tattoo. I, I, I'm not going to get one. But um, I don't like the way it looks. The most beautiful um, uh, um, Rottweiler I've ever seen was belonged to a friend of mine, Carl. And it was from Germany. And it had a full tail and full ear. And it was the coolest looking Rottweiler I've ever seen. I'm not a big fan of Rottweilers. Um, the looks, I should say. I like their personalities. But, um, you know, if it's done at a really early age... It's, you know, it's not the end of the world, but the ear docking thing, I just think it looks bad. It's, you know, I know why they do it. You know, it's the idea to it was for fighting dogs because it would be less of an ear to tear off. That's the really idea behind it. And it's one of those things that's supposed to make the dog look tough. I always say, if you need a tough dog, you should just study martial arts because you should be tougher, but <laughs> not my thing, but yeah. I like that question. Thank you for that. Yeah. Okay. Um... Okay, I have an eight month old Mal. Every time we're out and I stand for a minute to talk to check my phone quickly or just stand, he jumps and bites my arms and gets a full grip. Not too hard, but it can be annoying. So that goes back to you got the dog you got, right? Mal and Waz are going to bite. That's just what, you know, if you don't want that, then you shouldn't have got the Mal and Waz. And the, I mean, the biggest thing I always try to tell people, you don't have to be a superstar dog trainer to have a dog like a Malinois, but you have to understand what you're getting into. Mm -hmm. So if you have a dog like that, you have to kind of pay more attention to it. It's, I think it was a young dog, right? Eight month old. Yeah, so it's an eight month old dog. So you need to teach the dog behavior. So when you're standing still, that dog wants to do something. Your dog want, wanted your attention, so it's barking. This dog wants the person's attention, so it's jumping and biting. Um, you have to teach the dog that's not a behavior that's going to be accepted, correct the dog, and, um, you know, and, and fix it slowly. It's an eight-month-old dog. It, it needs a lot of time to learn. Mm -hmm. Okay. Boris Pale is asking, is Rika still alive? Haven't heard her in ages. Yes, she's alive and well. She's actually standing here right next to me. If you caught the beginning, you'd see she worked it out, and I let her out. Mm -hmm. Okay, Artista Tia, advice about prong collar. Mal puppy six month continues to pull through the discomfort. Also seems it's either too loose or too tight, but regardless, our dog pulls and forces the collar to move around. Well, well one is, uh, you know, on, on most every dog I've ever worked, up to like 80 pound dogs, I've always used the little Hermspringer, the, the 2.25 millimeter prong. I, people always get the mediums, I don't know why. Um, the, the sizing, they're much bigger prongs, so they're harder to get a proper size on. The small ones don't. So that being said, I really don't, I don't think the prong collar has to fit like everybody says right under the ears. That's the ideal place for it. It's the best correction for it. But if the dog is working against the prong and pushing through it, the person more than likely has never taught the dog leash pressure. And for a dog to learn, to, for a dog to be put on a prong and not be taught leash pressure first, it's, you know, it's like me putting somebody in with Mike Tyson or, you know, to, to fight and you've never done a sparring match. Mm -hmm. Teach the dog leash pressure. There's a lot of good trainers out there. I'm not, I'm not the only one, but there's a lot of good ways to teach the dog how to turn off the pressure on the leash. Because the reason the dog is pushing through the prong 
is because you haven't taught the dog how to turn off the pressure, mm -hmm. right? And everything is about pressure and release. Once the dog understands that, then um, what an easy thing to do. A dog wants to please you. A dog doesn't want to be um, uncomfortable. The prong makes the dog uncomfortable. And luckily it works in such a way that the dog instantly learns how to turn it off so that the bad behavior triggers the uncomfort, the discomfort, which then turns, teaches the dog how to turn it off and the dog goes back to comfort. comfort. Mm -hmm. I want to go back to the whole, like, people, well, if they got a Belgian Malinois, know what you're getting into. For those people yeah. that, you know, know what they're getting into, did all mm -hmm. the research, and then they have a Malinois in their home, and they yeah. realize, like, this just, like, they can't do it. What is the best way to handle that? Or is it something that, like, you think that they should try to work through it, or... Well, you, you know, you got to work through it. We live in a society now where everything is feel good, right? Everything is, oh, you know, well, let us help you or let us do this, let us do that. Um, you know, when I taught karate, a lot of people got punched in the face, right? And I got kicked in the ribs. And th then the reason you got kicked in the face or whatever is because you didn't block, which means you didn't understand the basics of what I was teaching you in the beginning. You've got a Malinois. The, the easy solution, people always do it. They'll buy a Malinois on Craigslist. And then they um, end up with this dog. They don't know what to do. And then they dump the dog in the shelter. So we're seeing more and more Malinois in shelters. So part of that goes to, one, you see so many dogs in the movies and people are stupid. They think, well, I saw, you know, I saw John Wick 3 and, you know, and uh, what's her name? Had two Malinois and they were perfectly trained. I can do that. No, you can't, right? It's like I watched, watched The Fast and the Furious and I know I can't drive like those guys. So this is a fantasy we have. We, we always, we're so taken by social media and, and Hollywood and all this crap that we buy into the hype. So if you have a Malinois and you did it, you're in this one, right? You gotta make this work. And I always say, if you can't make it work, take the dog to the vet yourself and put him down in yourself in your arms and say goodbye to him because you screwed him up. So that's a really big thing. It's not fair to put that dog in a shelter. It's aggressive, it's confused and hope somebody else can make it work because they can't. Because every time you put a dog in a shelter, another innocent dog in the shelter dies. And I've seen that. I've seen it day in and day out. It's bullshit. So if you got this dog, hunker down, you know, man up or woman up or whatever you want to do and train this dog. Get, there's tons of free. I mean, my channel is only one of many really good channels. You've had really good trainers on your show. Get one of these trainers hunker down and train your dog, right? It's, it's something that you got to own up. You got to be responsible and that's it. There's nothing else to it, right? You got to train this dog. So if you were, if you were courageous enough to get it then you better be courageous enough to learn how to train it. And that's what, that's what, that's the way it goes. Great answer. Um, okay. I love all your references to martial arts and karate. I'm a boxer. So. Oh, there you go. And I appreciate Same thing. That. Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. Jordan Samuel, personal question for Robert. When are you getting on the Joe Rogan podcast? Everybody's asked me that question. <laughs> I love Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan's a martial artist. Joe Rogan and I have so many things in common like that. Um, I would love to. I mean, I just think he's cool. He's one of the few people I actually like. <laughs> I like him too. Okay. Bastion Bain, can you teach a pup too much? Well, you can't teach a pup too much, but you can expect too much. Right. I think the biggest mistake people make is they expect way too much of their dog and they start flooding the dog with information. All you need to do really is get your dog to want to learn. That's the number one thing we want to focus with dogs. We want to we want to make them want to learn. The, the learning process must be enjoyable. And some days you can't do it. Right. Um, this is what, where I always say, you know, I always get, get accused of being sexist. But this is where I think when I watch Janet train a dog, it's much nicer than the way I train a dog. And that's because a woman has a nicer maternal way with the dog. Like Dwayne's upbringing, I give all the credit to Janet because she's done such an amazing job. Um, and she was always patient with him, always like, you know, um, affectionate to him, always understanding of where his limits were. As men, you know, and, and I use that term loosely, um, we, we tend to, we expect too much. We're kind of too hard with this and with that. And it's funny because, you know, Janet really calls me out all the time. It's like with Boz, she'll hold him a certain way. I flip him on his back and I've got him. He's 18. And she says, well, that's the difference between a mom and a dad. A mom is going to baby the dog and a dad is going to, you know, let him get his knees skinned up. 
what you really want is you want to form that balance, that yin and yang, mm -hmm. right? Where you have so much strong, so much weak, so much power, so much compassion. And, and that really works the best for the dog. But, but too much, no, but you can expect way too much. So be compassionate, be, be a little bit more nurturing to a puppy. Think more of a mom than a dad, where when it gets to that adolescent phase, then think more like a dad and think like, hey, you're not allowed to do that crap. You're gonna get in trouble. Mm -hmm. That's definitely what I have to work on right now with the eight months with that turn being more strict. Yeah, it's hard. I mean, it's, it's something that, you know, it's usually not inherent in the female energy. I don't, if I don't want to say men and women, because it's, it's the wrong thing to say. That. But in the female energy, it's a nurturing energy. The male energy is more of a conquering energy, right? So mm -hmm. whatever you have or identify with or whatever, you have to understand that a being like a dog needs a balance of that. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's important for you to infuse it into your, into your dog, especially a dog that can get in trouble like a Malinois, a Mastiff, a Rottweiler, a, a more powerful dog. It's not just a little, you know, Yorkie poo. Right. Okay, what are your thoughts on neutering? Again, it's a personal decision. I mean, you know, we're one of the only countries in the world where we, we're so gung-ho on it. Um, <clears throat> we do it, I'll tell you why I love it because a lot of morons have dogs, they're irresponsible. They get, they let them run outside. Oh, my dog's really friendly. It gets a dog pregnant. You have 10 puppies that uh, nine of which are gonna end up uh, in the shelter, right? Which are gonna be killed and they're gonna end up in a barrel and then made into compost, which is really disgusting. But, you know, you, you, we don't neuter our children, right? Um, people, and then you'll get the lies. People say, oh, the reason you wanna neuter is because you wanna prevent testicular cancer. You wanna prevent mammary cancer. Well, if you cut the organ off, I mean, if I pulled one of my lungs out, I won't get lung cancer in that lung. So it's a lie that we tell people. Now, a neuter dog is easier to handle because it doesn't have the testosterone, right? Mm -hmm. But a female, sometimes when we spay them too early, we can create aggression. There's a reason, and I always say this right or wrong, but I say there's a reason God gave us the sex organs, and it's to develop into the sex that the sex organ is supposed to pr pr become. A, a dog, a male dog is going to have testosterone. That's what you're dealing with. That's what you, that's what you got. That's really what you should be able to handle. If you can't handle that, you should get a stuffed dog or a gerbil because you're just going to have that. It's, it's, it's responsible to do, but only if you're an irresponsible person, right? If you can't manage your dog, it's, you, you just got the wrong dog. Um, if you have health issues at some point, the dog is overly obsessive, the dog is older or whatever, fine, do it. But it's not, it's, it should not be a problem solving thing. Okay. Um, red pills. What's the best way to join a French ring club? And why is it so hard to join? Well, because, you know, really good French ring is one of the hardest sports. And, and the reason it's hard to join is because they don't want to waste their time with idiots, right? And if you haven't proven yourself, and you're just going to show them go, Oh, I want to learn French ring. And you go in there and you spend, you spin their wheels for a month or two. And then you go, mm, I don't want to do French ring. I want to do Monty ring, you know, or I want to do AKC or I want to do dock diving. They wasted their time. And I was a member of an IPO club and they would always have people in. And then the, 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 the guys who were in the club would always be doing all the training. And then we never had a decoy to work with. So it's stupid. It's a waste of time. You know, in the martial arts, again, back to the martial arts analogy, when you came to my dojo, you're going to clean floors first right? Because I want to know you want to be there. So if you want to join a French ring club, French ring clubs don't want you because they want to train their dogs. They don't want to spin their wheels with somebody who's going to waste their time and then decide, wow, it's too much work. I can't do it. French ring is a super complex sport. So is Mondio and IPO. But the, the biggest waste of time is people who just come in and think they want to do it. They're gung-ho. They're there five days a week for the first two or three weeks. And then they go, you know, I, I haven't been really able to go back to my, my, um, my hot yoga. And then they're back to hot yoga and their dog's, you know, suffering in the background. Right. You got to make a decision. You got to prove yourself before you join a club. Mm -hmm. um, another question on that topic. Um, if you're thinking about getting into dog sports um, before, let's say, going to a French ring club and wasting people's time, mm -hmm. uh, how to, do you know, like, which sport would be right for you or right for your dog? Google. <laughs> YouTube. I mean, I would go to YouTube and I would, I mean, there's only three real, I mean, PSA, I don't even know if many people do PSA anymore, but there's French ring, Mondial ring and IPO or IGP or whatever they call it now, Schutzen, you know, mm -hmm. um, you could really go through YouTube and, and go through and find, wow, okay, this is French ring. I would, I would study it. 
You know, I mean, I would really try to understand what is the difference between Mondio Ring and IPO. And then I would start to figure out, okay, is this something I want to do? Do I have the right dog for it to start with? Was the dog mm -hmm. bred for it? Because if he wasn't bred for it, he's probably not going to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, that's just, you got to, you just got to understand that. You know, I really wanted to play basketball. I, I can't. Mm -hmm. um, another question um, regarding trainers. Um, can you give me other recommendations for other good trainers that you think highly of? Well, you, you had Larry Crohn on. I like Larry uh, and I like Oscar. I mean, I think they're two of the top trainers, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I really do. I don't really go by famous trainers, you know, that just that they're good. Um, sometimes you find the best trainers. I mean, this guy, Jimmy Van, who's a really good um, decoy and trains dogs. He works mainly with police departments. Um, it's hard for me because most of the trainers that I know, you know, again, I mean, I, I, I think Oscar's fantastic. I, you know, I, I mean, he and I are friends and I've watched him, you know, we met each other like eight or nine years ago and I sent him a picture after we reconnected our friendship. And I was like, dude, remember this when we were at this Mondio club and I was doing goofy and he's like, Oh man, I don't remember that. So, you know, it's, it's also who clicks with you, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, dog training, like I said, is, is such a moronically simple thing to do. I don't know why people make it so complicated. Um, but it's really somebody who gels with you, somebody who really gets you and, and gets your dog. Because if they don't, they can be a great trainer, but if they don't get, if they don't get you and get your dog, they're not good, mm -hmm. right? Okay, back to the research. Okay, how do I allow my two-year-old cane corso female to allow to be petted? She is non-reactive, but when people reach towards her, she snaps at them. Well, but then she is reactive, right? Yeah. So she can't say she's not reactive, but when people reach for her, she snaps at them. Um, I mean, I would teach the dog, you know, first of all, you want to get the dog in the situation where people are present and the dog's not expecting something. More than likely, the dog um, is feeling some kind of a pressure, right? So what you want to do is get somebody close to the dog. You want to kind of get the dog, you know, the hands moving in front of the dog. And then, you know, remember every time if, if they put their hand forward and the dog snaps and they pull back, that it's, it's instigating a game for the mm -hmm. dog. So obviously you don't want to get bit by, a, uh, you know, a corso, but you also want to start to make sure that dog is a little bit more social. Put the dog in a sit, you know, have somebody in front, let the dog get, let the person get their hand sniffed, go away. Take it in steps. Everything's about steps. You know, I mean, we don't get in shape by going to the gym for a week. We get, you know, we, we, we pain ourselves through it. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me see what other questions that were sent here. Um, how do you get your Mally to socialize around kids? So, so one of the biggest mistakes people make is they try to socialize with children in particular, a Malinois that wasn't exposed to them at an early, early age, right? If they're not, if they haven't had a good experience or at least a neutral experience at a really early age, it's one of the hardest things for, especially a Malinois with the increased prey drive for them to understand. Um, if you get the dog from a good breeder, that breeder at that five week window has had that dog around kids mm -hmm. and, and it's kids who are good with dogs, right? Not just like the random kid at the park um, who comes screaming and, you know, flailing their arms and, and running up to the dog. Um, some, some children who are neutral. I mean, when I had first got Goofy, uh, my friend um, Ken was, had a daughter and she was really good and Goofy had been socialized by, by his breeder. So um, it was really an easy decision for him to meet somebody and this girl, with this, she sat in my yard and Goofy climbed her lap and that was it. So mm -hmm. Goofy's, you know, is really good with kids, but he hasn't had a lot of exposure to them since then. But it's those formative times, those formative early weeks and, and months that you got to Get, you got, and you got to get kids who are really dog savvy. Mm -hmm. How important, how critical, critical is it to do your research on breeders and um, what role do breeders play in the growth of a dog later on? Well, it's, it's the, it's the biggest, it's the most important decision. It's like getting to know your partner. You know, I mean, if you're going to, you know, I mean, I wouldn't want to date or marry somebody that I didn't really look into, like, what are their background? What, what are their ethics and stuff like that? So I want to know what that is on the breeder, because it's going to be passed into the dog. They, they just breed, you know, uh, their Malinois with their friend's Malinois because they, they were both cute, you know, or did they do health testing? Did they do temperament testing? Did they do genetic testing on the dog? Um, a good a good breeder will 
be a life support for the life of the dog, right? They're not going to breed dogs who, um, who, who shouldn't be being bred. And if they do on accident, they're going to neuter the, the neuter, you know, I mean, on accident, like it didn't work out, mm -hmm. um, then they're, they're not going to do it again. You know, the good breeders don't just breed for one thing. They, the most important thing they breed for is temperament and other things, you know, but, but temperament has to be first and foremost, right? Mm -hmm. You can't just breed a dog um, that's great at biting and, and has a really good natural aggression, but it can't live in society. I mean, it's going to be living in a kennel and be brought out. And I've seen this in IPO. You know, there was a, a person, I'm going to leave it at that, who had a dog and the person went to shake the judge's hand at the tracking and the dog like latched onto the judge's arm at a tr on a tracking field. So it's insane. It's just not a good dog. I don't care how good. And the dog was a really good protection dog, but it was a horrible dog because it, it just had horrible temperament. Mm -hmm. um, what's the best age to get your dog involved in dog sports? Early as possible, right? Exposure should start at that eight to 12 week window. Okay. Get the dog, you know, into that environment because that's what you want to do with the dog. The dog should... You know, at that, at the very first, a friend of Janet and mine just had puppies, um, Patty, and she, they're little Aussies, and she's already, they're already doing stacking, and they're ready, to, and they're six, five, six, seven weeks old, mm -hmm. right? The sooner you can get them exposed, the sooner you can get them into it, the better it is for the dog. So with Rika, she's eight months, is it too late to, to introduce it to her, or is it's that... It's never too, it's not, I don't say it's never too late. It's, it's definitely not too late. It would have been better early on because there would have been things that could be conditioned and really shaped in. The best way for a dog to learn things is through biomechanics, is through things that come naturally to them. You mm -hmm. Otherwise, you end up teaching them, right? So teaching things is one thing. Absorbing things is another. So you'll see, like, kids who are great swimmers or kids that their parents took them at, like, you know, a few weeks old and put them in a pool and they learn to swim because it's natural. Um, other things are taught and taught things are different. Like, you know, so I can teach somebody how to sing, but eh, they're probably not going to sing that great. But if you were in church early on and you were singing in the choir, you can just be a naturally good singer. You might not know anything about what you're doing correct, but it's natural. And it's the same thing with dogs. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so helpful. Okay. Any... Okay. One more question for Robert. If you guys want to get your last questions in, let's see any I missed. Oh, okay. Black sheep travels. I'm bringing home a new puppy soon. Is it okay to create the new puppy in the same room at night with our current older dog? And I'm going to well, piggyback on it. Where should the crate be? Well, you know, crating is, you know, we always, we created Dwayne in the same room. Um, first, the first thing we did is we put Dwayne in the, in our main room where we are always at and all the dogs would be in and out. You want the dog definitely to ex be exposed to the other dog and the other dog to be exposed to the new dog. But, you know, and, and then you'll start to see how the dog then takes to your current dog, takes to the puppy. Because you don't want to just wing it, like let them out. And you also, really importantly, I just talked to a client of mine on the phone. Um, you don't want to hide that dog, right? Because your current dog can smell them and can hear them just because they can't see them. And it makes it worse. So for the dog to see the dog in a crate will then expose the dog to it. And it's going to have much better um, chance of working out that way. Mm -hmm. And then where should the crate be at home? If you it doesn't really that? matter. You know, I mean, I don't, I do really think the people should have the dog um, in an area where they can see it, but it shouldn't be right in this, in the common area, right? In other words, if you put it where the dog always sees you, well, then you're going to build separation anxiety at some point, right? You, you want the dog to see you and then not see you. Like with Dwayne, we kept Dwayne um, in, the, in the living room and then we'd go upstairs to sleep. Mm -hmm. Well, now Dwayne has no separation anxiety at all. So now he, he sleeps, you know, every, every single morning we wake up and Dwayne is, you know, cuddled next to Jan or cuddled next to me with his head, you know, on top of that person looking at the other one. Because we know, I know I can put him in a crate downstairs and he'd be fine. Once mm -hmm. I know the dog is fine, then I can um, move the dog beyond that. But, you know, it, it takes a little bit of time to make sure the dog cries his way through the night. And I got some gruff on that. People said, oh, you know, my child, I did this and that. But I don't really care how you raised your child. You probably did it wrong because you probably coddled the kid too much. You know, sometimes a little tough love really doesn't hurt. Mm -hmm. When did you start allowing Dwayne to sleep in the bed with you guys? 
I think he was about a year and a half. Okay. You know, and he's not allowed to sleep in the bed. Like we start out just us in the bed and then um, you and Jimmy's on the foot of the bed. Jimmy gets special privileges. Then sometimes Goofy will be in the other foot of the bed and then Dwayne gets kicked off a couple of times. And then um, Janet sleeps through the night much, much better with Dwayne. So, you know, she'll, when he ends up there, I just say, okay, forget it. Just let him stay there. And then she said, when did Dwayne get in the bed? And I said about four hours ago, you know, when he jumped on top of me. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's not, I like dogs in bed. I think it's really important that you have a partner who's wired the same as you, because mm -hmm. if you don't, you got, it, it'll never work out. Right. Yeah. And then you got to make that decision between the partner and the dog. So um, it's, yeah, you, you got to be wired the same, but you know, a year, year and a half, you want the dog, you want the dog to be very independent mm -hmm. before you let him sleep in the bed with you. And it should only be generally um, by permission. Like, okay, come in the bed. You can come in the bed. You know, it's okay now. Um, mm -hmm. And then you have a nice balanced dog. Otherwise, you got a dog that's too uh, too pushy or too needy. Mm -hmm. Okay. The closing question is actually going to be my last question. Okay. Um, for COVID puppies uh -huh. that have been with their owners this whole time, and we don't know uh -huh. when we're going to go back to normal or whatever. Yeah. That is, uh, how would you deal with separation anxiety? Start doing it now. See, Janet just answered the question. Five a.m. That's when he gets in bed. It's usually before that, by the way, honey. Just so you know, <laughs> she says five years. But he does get in early. Um, you know, the thing with COVID, I think COVID was actually a good thing for socializing dogs because you didn't have people, you know, just running up to your dog saying, oh, can I meet your dog? Because I hate that. And, and Jan is one who hates it too because people run, rush up with their dog and your dog, can my dog say hi? With, it's not really, can my dog say hi? It's like, hey, my dog's coming over to say hi. Um, the, the thing with COVID, it made everybody so like afraid, God forbid, if you sneezed, you know, they would be like six miles away from you. And it gives you the chance to kind of like expose your dog to it. Okay, Goofy, you got to get off. This looks very, very wrong here. Um, it, it, gave, it gives you the chance to keep that distance. Your dog sees them. The dogs can kind of get close. You know, that's the key to socialization is, is that whole idea of getting close enough, but not too close. But your question was about separation anxiety. So start building that into now in other words put the dog in the crate and go out leave the dog in the house and go out do this through exercise that you know that you um set the dog up for it teach it okay i'm going up i mean i wrote an article on separation anxiety. it's probably better if somebody read that but teach the dog in slow duration like leave for 10 minutes come back you know leave for an hour or two come back you know leave for three hours come back go go to a friend's house do anything like that because then the dog is going to be used to it. All our dogs, you know, they, they have each other. They're fine if, if we leave them. Um, and, you know, see, now they're all going. There's Dwayne. Um, do it. Start now. Like, always start now. Co teach the dog what you want before you have to correct the dog for what you don't want. Mm -hmm. Good advice. Robert, thank you so much. This was Good, thank you so helpful and we have been following your channel since the start and you've been so helpful for us so thank you oh good well thanks for having me on it was a pleasure talk to you soon all right take care <laughs> thank you bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.